it is a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, introduce uh, Professor Ovidiu Savin from uh, Columbia University. Uh, I can't refrain to mention that uh, uh, Ovidiu got his PhD at the University of Texas uh, before going to uh, uh, Berkeley and then, of course, being, becoming professor in uh, Columbia University. Uh, Ovidiu is uh, an expert in uh, partial differential equation. Uh, his uh, more well-known uh, and famous result is about uh, the De Georgi conjecture. Uh, basically, he showed that uh, in dimension smaller than eight, any global solution of uh, an important uh, semilinear equation is actually only uh, one dimensional dependent. And uh, that's a pretty, uh, pretty nice result. And especially it has been shown that it cannot be true for the dimension bigger than the bigger or equals than nine, right? So it's, it's really the threshold. But of course, it did uh, a lot of striking results uh, in a lot of uh, other uh, areas, like uh, the infinite Laplacian, mont jean equation, and so on. Uh, it got a lot of recognition, uh, especially talked uh, uh, as an invited speaker at the ICM in 2006. And uh, he got the Stompakia Medal uh, in 2012, which is uh, a recognition which is given only once every three years in the broaden uh, area of uh, PDE and calculus of variation. So uh, please uh, welcome uh, Ovidio. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the introduction. Okay, so the plan today would be to give a, let's say, elementary talk about non-local equations and how they can be extended one dimension higher to get local equation of, of second order. And uh, let's say this observation led to a lot of the development in the field in the last 10 years. So I would like to focus on this aspect so first of all, let's say what are local PDEs and what are non-local PDEs, what do I understand by that? And if we have a function u of, uh, let's say, of x position in t time, we say that we have a local PDE if we are given some relation between u and the partial derivatives. It could be first, second, and so on, higher derivatives. And this is a local equation because in order to check it, we just need to know the function u in a neighborhood of the point where we check. On the other hand, non-local equations, they are, let's say, an example of a non-local equation is written here on the bottom, which is called aggregation equation, which, let's say, the function u evolves in time according to, let's say, ut has to be minus uv sub x. But v, on the other hand, is given as a convolution kernel, let's say, u convolved the given kernel. So for this equation to check it at a point, you really need to know u. You. You, really <coughs> you really need to know u on the support of k, which could be the whole line. Yeah. So this would be an example of a non-local equation. OK. So let's say the plan of the talk would be to first introduce the fractional Laplacian, which is the simplest non-local operator. And I would like to I'll give several definitions, but I would like to insist more on an extension property in which uh, this non-local operator can be realized locally in one dimension higher. Then I'll spend some time about uh, the theory, I mean, just a bit of time about the theory of second order equation, PDEs. And the maximum principle plays a very important role in the theory. Then somehow maximum principle also applies for this sort of non-local equations of, of order between 0 and 2 of elliptic type. So I'll just mention some more general result that are inspired by the second order to the non-local non case. And uh, let's say in the last part of the talk, I would like to talk about some non-linear problems where this extension in one dimension higher from non-local from non to local plays an important role and, let's say, was, was fundamental in, in, in solving some problems like the thin obstacle problem, let's say. And so I'll talk about two, two subjects that I'm most familiar with, which would be thin obstacle problem and, let's say, minimal surfaces of non-local time. OK, so let's see. Let me, let me move to the next slide, which would be, let me, let me say, how, do, how does one defi define a fractional derivative? 
So let's say we start with a function u. I just restrict first to one dimension from r into r. Let's say c infinity bounded. And I will look at the first derivative, second, third derivative. And we say, how do we define a derivative abstractly? And let's say if du, I call here du, is a derivative of u if you want d to be linear, to act linearly on the functions. You want d to be translation invariant. So when you translate, you also the derivative should translate the same way. And also to distinguish between the order of, of which derivative you are taking, you want to perform a dilation. Let's say if you dilate by lambda, the derivative should pick up lambda to a power. Let's say to sigma, and you call this sigma, let's say, the order of the derivative. If you would insist also to say that d depends just locally on, on the function, let's say when you compute du at 0, it just depends locally on, on u, then we just end up with the classical derivatives, first, second derivative, and third derivative. But let's not be so restrictive and say, well, let's just look at these three, a, let's say, with these three properties, and then let's see if there, is, there are some derivatives that have these properties, a, b, and c. And we'll see that there are such derivatives. And one, one question, what would be interesting, would be to find some sort of, let's say, first-order derivative, but which is isotropic. By isotropic, meaning that if I look at the origin, and look at the function u, and then I would just flip it around, I would get the same answer. And clearly, the first derivative does not have this property, because you distinguish in which direction you are moving. On the other hand, the second derivative does ha it has this property that sort of is invariant under, under let's say, rotation. Uh, so let's say there is the question, is there a derivative of order 1 which is isotropic, yeah, having this property? And we'll see that there is only one choice. And let's say uh, that's what we do here. The translation invariance basically decommutes with translation, which in the infinitesimal it says that d has to commute with infinitesimal translations, which are classical derivatives, right? So this, this equality has to hold. And if you apply it twice, you get that basically the derivative of the cosine has to obey an ODE, which is uh, the second derivative of d cosine is minus d of cosine. So the derivative of the cosine function can only be a linear combination between cosine and sine, because you know how to solve this ODE. Now you want it to be, now we're using that you want it to be isotropic. So if you want it to be the isotropic, the derivative of the cosine should just be, should, should be even as well. So here, sort of the choice would be that you don't want any b. You want b to be 0. And a, let's say, to be a constant. Let's take it 1, for example. So the derivative of the cosine has to be cosine. By derivative, the derivative of sine has to be sine. So you end up that the only choice you have is that the derivative of e to the ix has to be e to the ix. So, so far, we just use properties A and B. And also, let's say, also the last property to, to rule out some constant. Now, if you want to use how, if you want to check how the acts on dilations, then you dilate Ix by a factor C, and you see that the derivative of e to the i Cx has to be precisely this. Which means if you write u as a superposition of uh, uh, is a free series, basically what the u is going to do to each such wave is going to add, let's say, it's gonna, you're going to get a factor of absolute value of xi when, when you apply d. Yeah? So there is just one, let's say, just one way of defining this derivative of order 1, which is isotropic, which would be in the Fourier space. The derivative of u, when you look in the Fourier space, has to be the same as the derivative of u, of, of u but multiplied with the, with the frequency and the power 1. So what is more important, I, I want to insist a little bit more on uniqueness. So if there is up to a constant, this is the only possible definition. And now, to get other, let's say other, the same, the same thing in other settings, I just have to check that a, b, c, and this isotropic invariance holds. Yeah? So indeed, there are other ways of, uh, of defining this du. This, so what we are doing here is a first order derivative, which is isotropic. Yeah? And another way would be to look at second order incremental quotients. And they have all the properties except the, the dilation property. Except when, when we do a dilation, we're not going to pick up lambda to power. But then if we, superpose, uh, if we superpose a bunch of them, let's say, and we put a homogeneous weight. So 
okay, here. So if we put this homogeneous weight h to the beta, basically it's easy to check that this thing really scales. When you do a dilation, it scales with lambda to a power. And the power has to be 1 plus beta. We just have to be a bit careful when we put an, a weight like h to the beta on the bottom when we integrate these incremental quotients. Is we will have to make sure that this integral makes sense and has to be integrable at zero, which means the beta has to be less than one, and integrable at infinity, which means that I want beta to be greater than minus one. So somehow beta here has to be restricted between minus one and one in order for this integral to make sense. So if I want uh, a derivative of order one, I just have to take beta to be zero. So that's another way of defining first or isotropic first order derivative. And an another way, which I would like to insist more, and in some sense this is the, the what I mean, the, the purpose of the talk would be that we can realize this du as so-called Dirichlet Neumann operator. So the way to do this is we look, let's say, so we, we just look at an ex harmonic extension. So we have the function u that lies on the real line. And we just extend it here on the upper half space to a function capital U that is harmonic. And capital U agrees with small u on the bottom. And then we, we check that we, if you take, if you, if you stay on the bottom and you look at the derivative in this direction, if you look at u sub y, this indeed is a derivative of order one which clearly is isotropic. Yeah? So this is linear in, in this data small u. It's, um, let's say it's isotropic. And the scaling, if I scale u by lambda, the capital U space scales exactly the same way. And this is, this is the first derivative for the scaling. It's going to have the same homogeneity. OK, so this is a good way of, of defining it in some sense even, well, OK. So let's see, what happens now? So we define d in three different ways on the real line. What happens when I apply d twice? When you apply d twice, you're going to get back a local operator, which is minus the second derivative. You can, this is, you can see this in the Fourier side. You can also see it through the extension. So sort of if you apply u sub y twice, you get the capital U y y, which turns out to be, because capital U is harmonic, minus the, the drift index direction. So you get this thing. So in some sense, d is half a second derivative, half a second order derivative yeah, because of this property. On the other hand, d is not local, because when you look at the part b, clearly, to compute du at x, you have to know the function u in the whole space. OK, so now the question is, let's say, can I, we, we build the derivative of order 1. Can you do of different orders, not necessarily 1? And uh, all the constructions, I mean, not all. Let's say a and b generalize, obviously, you just have to put different power on the Fourier series or different betas. We already did it. On the other hand, this property of the harmonic function here is not clear. It, it seems to be particular to the Laplace equation, to the, to the first order derivative. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you have to put here? Maybe can you find an operator? And what do you have to put here? And this is something, let's say, that was observed that nowadays is called Caffarelli Silvestri extension. So this about 10 years ago, Caffarelli and Silvestri realized that basically any derivative between 0 and 2 can be, can be constructed in a similar way. And how do you do that? So what was very important in this example is that, let's say, you, I, I do a, uh, let, let's say, a power series expansion up to order 2 of u at the origin. Yeah. And what is very important is, let's say, u sub y is this coefficient b1 in the, in the y expansion. When I do a dilation to u, some, somehow this coefficient b1 picks up, if I dilate by lambda, picks up a lambda. So if I want to have a different operator, basically I want an expansion that would look like a0, b0, x, but in the y direction. I don't want it to be linear, but rather I want, let's say, the first order in the y direction to be y to some power sigma, and then plus lower order terms. So uh, in, in that case, if I, if I manage to find some operator on top, in that case, this coefficient, b sub 1, would scale, would have the scaling property like lambda to the sigma when, when I dilate by lambda. Yeah. So is there an operator? Can I replace Laplace here with some other operator that looks like Laplace? <laughs> such that the solutions to it, when I'm, when I'm very close to the bottom here in the y direction, things grow not linearly in y, but y to some power. 
it's not difficult to see that basically you want your operator to vanish on, let's say, constants. If I just focus only on the y direction, basically I want it to, to vanish on constants and let's say t to the power sigma rather than t. So in that case, instead of just having a second drift in the y direction, you would have to put some operator which kills this t to the sigma. So let's say the obvious choice in 1D would be to take the second derivative plus a, a term of this type, g prime of t over t, which scales quadratically, just, just the same way. But when you put a t to the sigma, t to the sigma would solve this rather than just linear solving this. Okay, so this is exactly what Caffarelli and Silvestri observed. So they, they prove rigorously that if, if instead of taking Laplace, if you take uh, UIY, but you add also this extra, let's say, a term UI over Y multiplied by y minus 1 minus sigma, then basically solution should grow in the Y direction like Y to the sigma. And if you look at that coefficient, let's say we call it by abusive notation the partial with respect to Y to the sigma, then this is a sigma order operator which is, uh, which is isotropic. It's a sigma, sigma, deriv sigma order derivative which is isotropic. So, uh, okay, now one way to think about this operator, let's say formally, is you think that what you have there on top, so what you have on top, uiy plus 1 minus sigma ui over y, you can try to think as being a rotation of u in 2 minus sigma variables. So formally, it's good to think that what you have on top is in fact really Laplace, but it's just extending not in one extra variable, but in 2 minus sigma variables. Yeah, this is I mean, it's essentially we have the same thing, but here no, we don't have one dimension, but two minus sigma dimensions, whatever that means. When sigma gets very close to two, this means you almost need to put no dimension on top because you're very close to the two derivatives on the bottom. When sigma is very close to zero, you have to put sort of two extra dimension on top, not really two, because then sort of that's a critical, a critical case. And there is also a divergence structure for this equation, just, just as Laplace equation has an energy, the same, the same way this operators, you just have to, to integrate the, Dirichlet, the standard Dirichlet energy plus this weight, but this weight you can try to think is simply just the rotation in the two minus sigma variables, like the volume element sort of gets multiplied by the distance to the axis. Well, so this, this uh, it turns out that this extension property of the, of the let's say, what, what we build here, we build, in fact, the fractional Laplace in one dimension. So this extension property was known a long time ago in the probabilistic context, but not known in the PD, unless in the case uh, of Laplace, which would be the, the, the case one half. And, well, as we'll see later in the talk, uh, I mean, th this, the fact of, of seeing things locally uh, would help a lot. So, so this, this was very helpful in the, in the obstacle problem that I'll mention later and maybe also say something about how, how extensions are very useful in non-local minimal surfaces. Okay, so now if you go, if we go to higher dimension and you want to replace the second derivative, well, this is the Laplace, and the Laplace can be viewed as basically like uh, you, you do the average of u at the origin, and you compute the second derivative with respect to r, see how this average changes as you increase the radius. Now, if you, if you remember definition b from before was some sort of average of incremental quotient, so basically it's, it's easy to to extend the definition to, to say that the, lap, the, the sigma isotropic derivative that I have in Rn should have this form. It's like some constant. And then the sort of spherical incremental quotient integrating against some kernel sigma. Yeah. So this is for any sigma between 0 and 2. So that the integral makes sense. It's OK. Now I want to insist also on, on a different interpretation, which would be a probabilistic interpretation of, of, of this. This is the fraction Laplace of order sigma. And in probability, this is known as being the generator of an isotropic sigma stable Levy process. What are Levy processes? They are stochastic processes like Brownian motions, but jumps are, are allowed. So, so it's not continuous. 
And let's say, what, what is an infinitesimal generator? Uh, if you have, like, let's say, if you have Brownian motion here, and uh, you have some nice function u, and you, you run the Brownian motion from x, you, you run it for a little bit, and you see incrementally how, how is the expectation changing. Because you're inspecting all the points near x, basically you're going to get that, this, uh, this change in the expectation is given by the Laplace. So you essentially obtain the heat equation. If sigma t turns out to be a sigma stable Levy process, then the generator, when you, when you are allowed to do different jumps, let's say, is going to be Laplace to the sigma over 2. So just to illustrate with the, with the picture, what's the difference between, uh, between regular Brownian motion and, uh, and uh, Levy processes. So this is a picture taken from Wikipedia. Uh, so on the right, we have a random walk. And on the left, we have a version of random walk, uh, which are called Le Levy flights. And Levy flights are essentially random walks in which the distribution to jump from one point to another, I mean, the, 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 the density has uh, not bounded second moments. And this, so this, this encourages a probability bigger than zero to jump at higher distances. And as you can see, I mean, there are long jumps on the left, while on the right, things seem to be continuous. Yeah. And Levy flights are observed throughout, uh, um, so let's say, in, in other applied sciences, like, for example, in biology, well, sometimes uh, the way sharks look for food, they would follow some sort of Levy flight uh, path. Because they inspect some, I mean, the, the, the reason here you inspect some area, but then you don't want to stay always in the same area. You want to you travel long distances and then do a search again. Also, jump processes are used in financial mathematics because they model better the, the let's say, the, I guess the, the prices since there are jumps. Let's say. Uh, now, if you take a, I mean, if you take a general Levy process, not necessarily isotropic and stable, then there is, let's say, a theorem in probability which says that the infinitesimal generator that you get has three parts. One would be a second order in U, which co would correspond to, to Brownian motion. Uh, one would be for the, let's say, a linear part. This would be for the drift. And there is also an integral part, more or less like our fractional Laplace. But the measure here, you're not integrating against the homogeneous kernel. You're integrating some kernel mu, and basically a measure mu. And this measure mu can be thought as the probability to jump instantaneously, infinitesimally, but, but right away from 0 to y. That would be given by mu of 1. However, for these general operators, there is no, I mean, I can no longer do this extension property. So, so this is not always possible. Okay, and let's say just, just some, I mean, there, are, there, is, there has been a lot of investigation uh, over the past 10 years about fractional diffusion, which can be, let's say, fractional heat equation would be this, and this can be interpreted as anomalous diffusion. Somehow the, t, the, the, the parabolic scaling no longer holds. Then you have to do different scaling in, in, t, in t and x. Let's say some, some, there are many examples, many equations to mention some so obstacle problem, which is relevant in financial mathematics, Landau equation in kinetic theory, surface quasi-geostrophic equation in fluid me mechanics, non-local minimal surfaces, and so on. So there are many, many such uh, many such equations. So I will just insist on, on two of them that I'm mostly familiar with, which would be the obstacle problem and the uh, non-local minimal surfaces. But before I do that, I say, uh, let's see. I, first, I would like to understand the equation, even in the simplest case, in which I take a, a, a fractional Laplace equal to 0, and I want to look at the Dirichlet problem. So in the, in the classical case, if I have Laplace of equal to 0 and u has to be given, I have to give data for u on the boundary of b1, this probabilistically means that I 
have a, a random walk that starts at x and I run it and wherever I hit the boundary I get paid g of x and then the expected value at x is given by the solution to the Dirichlet problem for Laplace equation. So similarly in, in this fraction Laplace we can try to think that we don't run the Brownian motion but rather run this stable sigma stable Levy flight, Le Levy process and the difference between the two equations is that now we have to give data outside of B1 because we can jump from inside the ball, outside of the ball. So, so in this, in the, in the bottom case, sort of the data, the equation being non-local, the boundary data becomes a, a, a data outside of the unit ball. Okay, so now let me just say very few things about just second order equation, no, no fractional, how, how does one deal with second order equations? And first of all, let's, say, let, let's look at the simplest case, which would be, well, second order elliptic equations. And let's look at the Laplace of equal to zero. How do we solve this? One way would be to write, a, to have a formula, and that's exactly what happens. We can write u as a convolution between u and the Poisson kernel. But uh, I, I want some more general principles that can work for nonlinear equations. And let's say if you want to look for general principles to solve La, the Laplace equation a bit, a bit more general, there are two different approaches. One would be to say an energy method in which you say I want to minimize some certain integral. And the second one would be maximum principle. When pr maximum principle, somehow Laplace has this property in the Laplace equation that if I start with some data on top of the other one, then the solution have to stay uh, ordered. So, so there is an ordering principle from the boundary data and solutions. And using this, you can somehow build a solution just by, let's say, a, a supremum of sub subharmonic functions. This is called Perron's method. They are completely different and they give sort of different answers because in the first one you're going to get an answer that belongs to a Sobolev space and in the bottom one, if you, if you run this process as a, as a maximum of continuous function, you're going to end up at best, let's say, with a continuous function. So this is throughout elliptic equation, you can build, let's say, easily a solution by relaxing the problem and finding compactness. Then what you have to do at the end is to say, that, well, what happens to this solution? This is the, regular, the question of regularity. I mean, how good are these solutions? Do they have two derivatives or not? So in elliptic equation, what is very important is, let's say, an estimate to go from L infinity to a little bit better, to say continuity. And this is called, let's say, diminish of oscillation. These are holder estimates, and, and, and they're very important. So, uh, I mean, all you want to prove is like this. Let's say you're given some bounded data. It's easy to see that your solution remains bounded. And so let's say this is, these are, let's say, the minimum and the maximum, and you have some solution here. All you want to do, the next step is to say, well, when I restrict to half the ball, if this solution is given, when I restrict to half the ball, I just want to make sure that the solution separates a little bit either from the bottom or from the top. I mean, I cannot be at the same time in B1 very close. I cannot touch essentially the top and the bottom. And this would be because of the maximum principle. If you, if you touch strong maximum principle, if you touch here, sort of the solution has to coincide with the top. And these are known as Harnack. This is a Harnack inequality, which is a quantified version of maximum principle. You don't, you don't say that I don't want to touch, but let's say you want to say if I'm, if I'm epsilon close to the top, then maybe, I mean, what you would like to prove that you are epsilon, of order epsilon close when you are in this region, let's say in between, uh, from when you stay a little bit away from the boundary. So this is known as Harnack inequality. It's very easy to, to prove it for the Laplace equation. And what happens here, well, let's see, if, if you, what happens if I separate a little bit from the bottom and from the top? Then I can rescale, I can go back inside. So let's say, let's say I separate it from the bottom. Then I go again to have the ball, and again maybe I can improve a bit from the bottom. I go from half the ball in, uh, in, and in, uh, improve from the bottom. And this way you can build some sort of holder models of continuity just by improving just, just by getting a small improvement at one scale 
by, by rescaling, it gives you a holder modulus of continuity of solutions. And then, then in the case of Laplace, you can iterate this infinitely many times because Laplace is a linear equation. If you just obtain a very tiny estimate like this, then you can just uh, apply it one more time to the incremental quotients and so on, you get that the solution has to be C2 alpha, C3 alpha, C4 alpha, and so on up to C infinity. Okay, let's see. Try. Maybe, maybe the battery does not work. Um, okay, so now what, what would be the next step for local equations? So the next step for local equation would be to understand not nice equations like Laplace equation, but rather equations with bad coefficients. So this uh, a class of such equations are called uniformly elliptic equations with measurable coefficients in which you remove the continuity of, of, the, of, of, of the matrix A of X. When A of X is the identity we are in the case of Laplace. And uh, in the case one, you can try to think that you're minimizing an energy like gradient of U square, but you, you have a matrix in front of that. The second one, you can say that, well, let's say, I mean, the, like Laplace setting, but the coefficients in front of the derivatives are changing, but not in a continuous manner. On the other hand, you have to assume that the matrix A, the eigenvalues of the matrix A are bounded from zero and infinity. And if you do that, it turns out that this Harnack inequality, this property is satisfied. And this is called Harnack inequality, as I mentioned. And uh, I mean, there are completely different methods for, for one or for two, but they give you the same result. And let's say that for, for one, this is known as the George and Nash Moser theorem. And for, for the Second equation is known as krilov safanov equation. These are equations of non-divergence form. And I would say they are like crucial for the regularity theory. Uh, why would such an equation be crucial for the regularity theory? So let's say for, for non, non-linear setting. So if I take a non-linear equation, let's say I have some, I call it f of d square of u. So let's say some combination of second derivatives, but f is non-linear. How, how, what is such an equation? So imagine that you take two linear equations and you look at the maximum or the minimum of them. So that would be a nonlinear equation known as Bellman equation that, that appears in control theory. Or you can do a min max, which would be more complicated, known as Essex equation. So if you have such an equation, what, what we usually do, let's see. So what we usually do, one takes the derivative of the equation and ends up here with fij, uij, so on. And this can be viewed as a linear equation for the derivative u sub b. So, so all that nonlinear things, you sort of, you say that the second derivatives, fij, evaluated this square of u, I just put a black box and I say those are some coefficients that hopefully I, I have some, some control on them. No, not a good control because I cannot control the second derivatives, but maybe just that the eigenvalues of, of d square of f are, is, are bounded from zero and infinity. So this would be a of x, and then the derivative would be your function v, v, i, j. So, so what we obtain here on the bottom is somehow, when you look at linear equations with rough coefficients, you can try to think of those solutions as being derivatives of nonlinear equations. Yeah, so if you can say something for linear equations with very bad coefficients, you're, you made some progress in the nonlinear theory. Okay, and uh, so let's say this would be for nonlinear second order equation. Now let's go, so, so we have to go back to the fractional case. Say, how do we understand now, let's go to the Laplace, the one half equal to zero. Let's go to do the same thing as we did for Laplace. And we take u to be given g outside of b1. And the best way to do it would be through the extension problem. So if, if you really write Laplace to the one half in the integral form, it looks complicated. But if you just try to say let's, that this is the data g here, this is u equal to g. I look for the extension u, capital U here, which is harmonic. And the fact that when, when I require Laplace the one half of u equal to zero, in terms of the capital U, I'm just requiring that the derivative u sub y is equal to zero. So it's like a Neumann condition on the bottom. Now, if I just reflect 
So if you take the function u and you just put it on the other side evenly, somehow this condition tells you there is no, no angle for the u sub y. So in fact, it turns out that the reflection is harmonic everywhere, including the bottom. So actually, what you're looking at, when, you, when you're looking at the solution of u in b1 to the Laplace of u over Laplace to one half of u in b1, actually, you, you just see the restriction of a harmonic function defining in, in b1 in one dimension higher, and you're just restricting it to the diameter. Yeah? So this be it becomes completely local equation in which, let's say, this capital U encodes information about the tails, right? So somehow the non-locality of G is encoded in the values of capital U here. But once you realize that and you have a bound on capital U, then you can just think I'm, I'm dealing, in fact, with the local equation, with Laplace equation. And you obtain, let's say, a bound on the C alpha, let's say, on the C alpha norm of U in terms of U in L infinity. When you unravel that, you get some sort of estimates in which you say the C alpha norm of U is bounded by U in L infinity, but the capital U in L infinity here is also bounded in terms of some integral norm of, of the boundary data G outside. And so, so the estimates look like this. Somehow the tails are very important. Okay, since uh, let me just go maybe a bit faster. Okay. On the other hand, you can still forget about the extension and, and just say, well, let's just lo work on the line and try to see, can we do some energy estimates? Can we do some maximum principle? And it turns out that you can do, pretty much you can reproduce a lot of the theory on the Laplace at, at the level without the extension. But one has always to be careful about, let's say, the behavior of you outside, or outside B1. So for, if you would look at the maximum principle, in this case, the maximum principle basically reads that if, if a function u, if the data of u has to be above the data of v everywhere outside B1, only then I can conclude that in B1 u is on top of v. So somehow you need to require much more of the data outside to conclude something inside. And some, some interesting remark would be that if you just look in B1, if somebody tells you I look in B1 at a, at a half harmonic function that is just in B1, basically you cannot say anything. So there is this, let's say this, this property that if you give me any function, if you give me any bad looking function in B1, like this, <coughs> I can, I can put some data outside such that when I solve Laplace to one half equal to zero, I can get as close as I want to this graph. So somehow there is no restriction from the equation if I just localize in B1. So all is the tails, this, this is the effect of non-locality, right? In some sense, I can, I can cook up the data nice outside so that when I solve the equation looks as I want in, in, in the ball of radius one. So it's like a bit of, uh, uh, um, I mean, the intuition is not exactly the same if you, if you, if you restrict yourself to the, real, to, to, to the line. On the other hand, if you do the extension, that, that would be like better. Uh, so let me mention just some results that one, there is that now, nowadays there is a satisfactory theory for, for integral differential equations with, with kernels that are measurable. This would be, let's say, the the generalization of, of, of the equations that we had with a of x a few slides earlier. Now, if you, if you take it to non to non-local equations of order sigma with, with coefficient, with rough coefficient, it, they would look like this. And uh, there is a Harnack inequality for, uh, for, such, uh, for such equation with measurable kernels. And in fact, one can recover the classical result, the second order result from this one as sigma tends to two. So somehow there is this nice extension of the theory where, where we can recover the local case from the non-local in, in a limiting setting. So the Harnack inequality, just to, to mention a few names, the Harnack inequality for measurable kernels, let's say some, some names, Komatsu, Barlow, Bass, Chin and Kassman, Caffrelli, Chen, Basseur for the parabolic, in non-divergence ca case, Bass, Levin, and Caffarelli Silvestri, who developed a, a theory of viscosity solution for, for uh, non-local equations. 
also for the parabolic setting, Chanlara and Davila. So there are many people that contributed to Harnack inequality. Now, let's say for, uh, now I wanna go in some nonlinear problems in which the extension is, uh, is uh, useful. And one, one problem, let's say, that I wanna talk about is the, uh, is the obstacle problem. So before I talk about the thin obstacle problem, let me just mention briefly what is the regular, the classical obstacle problem. So we're given some sort of obstacle, some function phi that you can try to think is the obstacle, given some boundary data here, like this, let's say it's zero, the boundary data, and then we try to put a membrane on, that is clamped on, on this wire and is on top of the obstacle. So this is the membrane here. And in some places, the membrane is going to stick to the obstacle, and in some other places, it's going to be on top of the obstacle. Yeah. This is the, let's say, the typical example of vari variational inequality. You want to m minimize surface area, but if you, if you linearize, if you look at the simplest model, let's, let's forget about nonlinear. Let's say that here, we want to minimize the Dirichlet integral. And you need the constraint, you want everywhere u to be greater than or equal than phi. And what happens here in the region where you separate, so in the region where u is strictly bigger than phi, you know that u is harmonic, just as before, and here you know that u is equal to phi. And uh, so either you are harmonic or you touch the obstacle, and there are some gl two global information that u is always bigger than the obstacle, and also global information is that Laplace of is always negative, because you can always perturb upwards, and you're going to increase the energy. So there are like sort of two global information, but at each point, either this holds or this holds. So. This has a probabilistic interpretation in which you, you think that you are here on the bottom and you run some sort of random walk. And at any point you can stop and say, well, when I stop here, I'm going to get paid the function phi. Yeah. And you have the choice, either you stop or not, or you can run, maybe hit the boundary and so on. So, so the solution to the obstacle problem tells you what is the best strategy to do. So if, if you are in this region where you separate from the obstacle, you should run the process, you shouldn't just uh, stop and get paid phi. On the other hand, when you touch the obstacle, that's a good place to stop and ask for, let's say, for the money. Say, I want, I want to get paid phi. Um, okay, and in this problem, what is the most interesting part would be what happens, all the action happens on the boundary of the set. So sort of here, things are boring, you're just on the obstacle. Also here, you solve a plus equation, so somehow you want to understand how you interact exactly, and, and this is called the free boundary. So let's say that the, the, the curve, if I look above at the picture, this would be the free boundary of, uh, of the problem, which is the, the boundary of the set where, let's say, u separates from phi. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, maybe I'm gonna, jump over the slides since I'm, since I'm a bit behind. Uh, but basically in the, in the obstacle problem to stay here, what, what you would expect, well, oh, actually let me, let me just make one simplification. So if you really focus very close at this point and you think, well, locally the function phi looks like a quadratic polynomial and if you'd subtract it, what, what you end up with, let's see. So if, if I would look at the function u minus phi, how u separates from the obstacle, and I still, by abuse of notation, I call it u, what I end up with, I end up with an obstacle problem like this, where the obstacle is zero, because this is a, I subtracted phi, and the function, instead of being harmonic, here satisfy Laplace of u equal to one, let's say, and here u is zero. And, and this can also be interpreted as you have a membrane that has some weight. So the membrane has some weight, wants to go down, and here you have a table. And here you're going to get some free boundary, the region where the membrane rests, rests on the table. Uh, so the, the key in the obstacle problem would be you want to understand very much these points. 
And the way to understand these points would be, I mean, the, the strategy is always the same. You take a point and you do a blow-up sequence and you hope you're going to end up in a good situation that you can classify. And somehow what is the behavior, like in a nice region, let's say what, what, you, what you really hope is that, well, sorry, I mean, let me just go a bit back. But I, I want to say, if you look there on the top, you really hope that U behaves like there's a quadratic polynomial on half a plane. So if I, if I blow up here, I think I'm going to end up with zero on one side and with the quadratic function on the other. With one half x dot nu square on the other. Okay, and it turns out that basically we can characterize in, in the classical obstacle problem, we can characterize things like this. However, in the, in the thin obstacle, well, now let's do the same problem for Laplace to the one half. So for the Laplace to the one half, you go back to this picture on top. And well, sort of you have, well, let me, let me, let me go back here. For the Laplace to the one half, somehow you have an obstacle and you have to, to do the problem in the whole space. So let's say you're going to end up with a, with a situation like this, but here you're going to have Laplace to the one half of u equal to zero. When you do it in terms of the extension, just as we did before, and you unravel what that means, and you subtract the obstacle, basically I'm going to end up with the following situation with the, with the, with the situation which I have a wire, draw here the wire, like this, and I have, let's say, a membrane that is attached to, let's say, to the wire, like this. Sorry. So I have this fixed wire, and I have a membrane that, let's say, the boundary of it, I'm pushing it down. Well, here it has to stay above the wire, but here on the side, I can really push it down, and I can make the elastic membrane to touch the wire, right? So this would be the thin obstacle in which the obstacle, instead of being a plate, like it was in this situation, now it's just a thin line. Okay, so we end up essentially with this situation in which you have a membrane, and you can try to think, well, this is your coincidence set, and let's say these two points, if, I, if I'm into D, the free boundary just consists of two points, but you can try to think of this problem in higher dimension. This would be the free boundary. And, and this problem is much more difficult for the following reason, it's not too difficult, let's say if you're in 2D, when you focus very close to, to, to on a free boundary point, to see that the behavior here should be like the real part of z to the power 3 half. So this would be like r to the 3 half cosine of 3 theta over 2. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking, if I look by above, I'm going to see a free boundary and a harmonic function everywhere around. This is Laplace of e equal to 0. When you, look, when you look at this point, you, want, you are going to see this behavior, but what happens here, you can have any constant. Yeah? So there is a, a big difference. In this case, when I'm on the plate, sort of the constant always is given to me, has to be one when I do a blow up. In the thin obstacle, this constant can be very tiny or can be very large. So I don't know exactly how to blow up because the blow up depends very much on this constant, a, if it's small or large. So you cannot really repeat so, I mean, so easily what you're doing in the classical case. And the way that this problem, let's say, was solved uh, by Caffarelli, Silvestri, Salsa, was to do a monotonistic formula for the extension, for this capital U. And essentially, when you look at this problem, you can try to think, so if, if, you, if you pay a bit of attention, you have a harmonic function that goes like this. It's not harmonic on the line, because it meets at an angle, sort of around. On the other hand, if you continue this angle and you wrap it one time, I mean, sort of if you take this picture and you flip it upside down one more time, you end up with a harmonic function, a double-valued double harmonic function. So actually, these points are not really points of singularity. This is just where the double harmonic function crosses itself. So, so I mean, this would, would suggest that what you, what you can do for harmonic function probably can do also for this double valued harmonic functions. And this is a monotonistic formula. Let's say there is a, a monotonistic formula called Almgren's frequency formula for harmonic functions, which tells you that if you have a harmonic function, you can, you can understand its homogeneity at the origin just by looking at this quantity, f of r, which is some sort of 
a ratio of quantities, and the CFFR is constant if and only if you is homogeneous. And this, would, this very well applies here, I mean, uh, even for double value function, and, and you can really end up with the correct behavior in the phenomenal problem. So w on the other hand, what is, uh, I mean, the monotonicity formulas are very nice and they're very powerful. On the other hand, they are very rigid. If you try to change, let's say, if you, instead of integrating on balls, try to integrate on ellipsoids, you end up with, uh, um, let's say, you, you cannot write a monotonicity formula. So the monotonicity formula, I would say, is very special to, to what, I mean, to, to the geometry of Laplace equation and balls. Yeah. And we are able to do that because we did the extension. If you try to write the monotonicity formula in the original variables, I mean, I think it would be very difficult to, to understand what that means. Okay. So, well, there is a new proof recently by Caffarelli, Rossotone, and Serra in which they basically managed to avoid the monotonicity formula, more or less following an approach similar to this case, but it's a little, a little bit more involved and you have to do a blow-up analysis, more careful blow-up analysis. I mean, the monotonicity formula gives you this behavior maybe a, a bit faster, by the way. So I think this, particularly at least for me, this paper on, on the obstacle problem and the extension, I think uh, made people realize maybe there are some monotonicity formulas for non-local problems and you can view them as as, uh, as problems, uh, as local ones, yeah, so the, and, and people are more familiar with local problems. And one, maybe one last thing, I mean, I, I'm running a bit out, so I'm not going to talk about the last topic, which I, I had something about non local minimal surfaces. But uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll, I'll stop here. But I want to say that, that also in the non local case, it's much more difficult to do computations yeah, because we know very well how to compute derivatives. On the other hand, if you just try to look for a very simple equation like Laplace to the one half of u is some nice function f of u, basically you have to know the function in the whole domain and to, to perform, to compute these things exactly would be, would be very difficult. So, so the difficult part in the local equations would be to, to do computations, while in local equations it's very easy because we can compute the derivatives. <coughs> Okay, so I, I run out of time, so I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Any questions or comments? Yes. So, say the same obstacle problem, you talked about the class to the one half, so that was the non local equation. Did you Yeah, so this is already the extension, right? So if you, if you, here I would draw something in 1D and I would have Laplace to one half of u, but once, when you do the extension, this Laplace to one half equal to zero becomes a u, capital U sub nu equal to zero. And then sort of in two dim, I can extend this in two dimensions and in two dimensions becomes this picture. Well, af after I subtract, okay, so <laughs> I have to subtract this wire, sort of. So, so, so this function file, let's imagine that is straight, that is zero. I mean, I, I did the extension and then I subtract the, 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 the wire. So let's say I can transform this into this after I do some, some I, I, I subtract the function. Yeah. So let's say this is exactly, let's say the, the whole point that this would be non-local, but this would be local and here, you can use the information of the extension to gain better insight on the solution, like, like a monotonicity formula. I mean, that, that, that in this setting, you, it, would, it would be very difficult to understand what it says. More? Uh, more derivatives than too well, so I think uh, a lot of it uh, <laughs> falls off. This is very much based on maximum principle. So once you get more than two derivatives, uh, uh, let's say, I mean, yeah, I think it, it, pretty much everything I said uh, would, would fail. Maybe, I mean, m m maybe the maybe the variational approach, something can be done still for the variational approach. Uh, 
but probably not not my, I mean I wouldn't expect any harm like any cult or anything like that yeah so so I think what what was, what was very important in this talk was that somehow what you see in second order equation you can see in all sigma order equation between zero and two but once you go above two uh, you lose maximum principle and, and everything falls apart